remember when we're starting these, we're counting valence electrons. And we're going to put them all in one big pile, and then we're going to distribute them so that everything has a full valence as much as possible. And so for this first one, SCL2, sulfur brings six valence electrons, each chlorine brings seven valence electrons. That gives us a total of 20 electrons to work with, right? So we have 20 electrons. And we now, now we need to decide out of SCL2, what should go in the middle? Why? That's two. It's two open spots. It's not as electronegative as chlorine. Um, there's only one of it, and there's two chlorines. It's that's a, a good hint. That doesn't always help. That is a, a hint that you can look at. So if we put sulfur in the middle, put a chlorine on each side. We know they have to be connected. And how many electrons do we have left now? 16 electrons left. I always make a point of asking that and saying it out explicitly because we need to remember each of these lines is two electrons. The temptation is to treat that each of those lines as one electron who's just one line, right? But each line is a pair of electrons. How many does each chlorine still need at this point? Six each, and there's two chlorines, so that's going to use up 12 of our remaining electrons just to fill in the chlorine. So let's do that. Now we're down to four electrons left. Chlorines are satisfied. Sulfur so still needs how many? Two pairs, so a total of four. So sometimes it's just that easy. There's nothing really tricky about it. Everything winds up with, with eight electrons, which makes it stable. And we used up all of our electrons perfectly. And our criteria for knowing whether or not we did we did a Lewis dot structure right. We're going to add to this in a minute, but the number one and two priorities are one, you have to use right number of electrons. We have to use 20 electrons. We can't use 22, we can't use 18 because we have 20 electrons, they all have to be accounted for. Matt? With this, but you also write just two double bonds on the side. So sulfur and that's still thing that you do. If you if I turn two of these lone pairs into double bonds, yeah. it wouldn't be as right. Okay. Sulfur could do that because sulfur it has a D orbital involved, right? Sulfur's on the third row of the periodic table, so we can go above eight electrons, and we'll see some cases today where we do wind up doing that to make it a better option. But in this case, chlorine doesn't want to be sharing any more than one pair of electrons, right? It only had one vacancy to begin with. So chlorine is going to be most stable when it only has one bond-ish. That's, that's our, our first rule, that the, we're, we're going to turn it on its head in just a minute. Um, and usually, in, if there are multiple options for, for Lewis dot structures, the third criteria that I'm going to put up here in a minute is going to be how we decide between multiple competing structures. Right? So, but before we get there, the second criteria is one. So, first is did we use the right number of electrons? We've got to follow conservation of mass. We can't make electrons out of nothing. If we have them, they've got to be used. And second, does everything have full valence? If you can say yes to both of those questions, then it is a valid Lewis dot structure. It might not be the best one, but it is a valid Lewis dot structure. 
And these are kind of going in order of importance. The most important thing is to use the right number of electrons. Then the next most important thing is, is does everything have a full valence? All right, so let's look at some of these others. Uh, let's look at, we'll do ammonia. And then maybe we'll do hypochlorite. All right, so ammonia is NH3. How many valence electrons do we have to work with? Valence electrons. So remember, don't count those 1s electrons from the nitrogen. All right, so nitrogen brings five electrons, five valence electrons. Pretty quickly, I'm going to stop. I've already kind of stopped saying valence electrons so obviously. Um, because really, now that we're past the point where you guys understand what electron configurations are, core elect what they call core electrons is everything that's not a valence electron. Everything that's in the lower energy levels, core electrons hardly ever matter. Very rarely do they actually make a difference or ever change, unless you happen to have a transition that will partially fill the orbital. So for the most part, when we say how many electrons does something have, in the, in the context of doing a Lewis dot structure, we're talking valence electrons, but I'll try to be very specific with that um, for at least the next next week, since we're still in the stage of studying for the midterm, right, and practicing counting all electrons as well. How many valence electrons does each hydrogen bring? Just one. So that gives us a total of eight. Nitrogen is going to go in the middle because it has the most vacancies. And because by definition, hydrogen can't go in the middle. You're never going to be able to put hydrogen in the middle because hydrogen can only form one bond. It only needs to gain one electron to have a full energy level. And it doesn't even have a P orbital that it can start to fill up of, um, in the same energy level. So we've used six electrons. Are we done? No. We have two more electrons we have to put in there, right? And we can't give them to a hydrogen, so okay. they've got to go with nitrogen, which matches nicely with the fact that nitrogen needed to gain two more to have a full valence. Right? So it's the same process over and over again, just with little details that change depending on what the exact compound is. And like I said, we'll add a couple of new wrinkles. Any questions on this so far? So not, worried about shape. Yeah. not yet that's this is the first step of figuring out the electron geometry or the molecular geometry the first thing you have to do is get your Lewis dot structure because you need to be able to count how many lone pairs and how many atoms are bonded to the middle atom in order to to figure out that shape so if i but if i say what's the Lewis dot structure this is what i'm looking for not the 3d shape <laughs> There was one more thing I was going to tack on to that. We'll get there in a minute. All right, any other questions on the basic Lewis dot structures, Matt? Uh, for that one, is it that good notation to circle the long pairs, or you're just um, especially when I'm up here working in on the board, I will almost always do it because from way back there, it's really easy to not see those pair of electrons so i always try to to add them that little circle because it's easy to lose them otherwise um or if you happen to have something like you know a a chlorine with a whole bunch of, of electrons around it it's really easy to not be able to count those particularly well it's a lot easier to count how many pairs of electrons you have when you do that but it does make your paper look a little busier. So your personal preference, I typically do just out of habit because it makes it easier for me to point to things when I'm, when I'm in front of the class. Any other questions? Yeah, 
the second rule is that the first one is using the right number of electrons. And number two is does everything have a full valence? So let's do CO2. We'll do one more. And then we'll move on. So CO2, how many electrons do we have to work with? Six from each oxygen, and there's two of them. So two times six is going to be 12 electrons from the oxygen. And we have one carbon, and carbon brings four electrons. So that gives us a total of 16, yeah. What's going to go in the middle, carbon or oxygen? Carbon. Carbon. It's got more vacancies. It's less electronegative. So our first instinct is to put carbon in the middle. How many electrons do we have left? 12 left. We used four of them. If you get really good at this, if you practice this a lot, you don't have to show every time you use electrons, you don't have to keep track of it like this, but you, it would still be a really good idea to at the end, when you think you're done, double check by counting how many electrons you use and make sure it matched up with what you started with. How many does each oxygen still need? Six. Six more, right? Each oxygen has two, the way it's drawn at the moment, still needs a gain. Six more each, and there's two of them. So how many electrons um, used if we fill up the oxygens? Twelve. Twelve, which would be everything we have left, right? Mm -hmm. So we used all of our electrons. Step one fulfilled. What about step two? Oxygens all have good full valences, right? The carbon doesn't. So we can't just add in electrons because we've already used all of our electrons. So what do we have to do? We have to rearrange the electrons that we have here so that they can fill both valences at the same time. So when you run out of electrons and you still have some empty spots, that almost always means you're going to make double or triple bonds. Right? And so the way we do that is, is now that we've used up all of our electrons, we have to erase a lone pair and turn that lone pair into a double bond. So now oxygen is sharing more than it was. But the carbon has more electrons too. Are we done? We still didn't hit eight with that carbon yet, right? We still need another pair of electrons to get shared again. Which oxygen should share? And why? It makes more sense. <laughs> Because as humans, we generally prefer things to have symmetry. It makes sense for it to be symmetrical. And nature, generally speaking, does follow that. Um, we could make one oxygen share three pairs of the carbon and one oxygen have three lone pairs. But why would we be pre preferring one oxygen over the other to, to share more? It makes more sense for it to be even. Now that we fill both of our, yeah, we use the right number of electrons and everything has a full valence. So from this one, since we were just talking about it, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this into one that doesn't look as good to us. And we'll talk about why it's not as, not as correct. Even though technically this still will follow our same our same rules, this one still meets the criteria, right? We still use the right number of electrons, 
and we still filled all the valences. So why isn't this one? This one is a valid Lewis dot structure, but it's not as good as the, the one that was more symmetrical. And so, go ahead. One has one over there, one has two. Well, so yes, yeah, so we have one lone pair over here. We have really three lone pairs over here, but it still meets those criteria. So if there is, if this is not as good as the ones where it was symmetrical, we need another set of criteria to determine which of the two possible options is better. And so we're gonna use a concept called formal charge. I'm gonna clear all this up so I can draw the two options are the other, the other possible structure up here. Um, and formal charge is basically a way of comparing how many electrons, so how many electrons something has around it now versus when it's on the periodic table as a way of saying whether or not something is um, more stable compared to the way it, was, it is on the periodic table. And so our other option, might as well just change color real quick. All right, so formal charge is kind of like counting electrons for filling valences, except that we, we basically say that if you have a pair of electrons that's in a bond, neither of those atoms really controls those electrons 100%, right? They're being shared between both of them. Uh, and so it's, you know, there's a lot of analogies that you could use, but anytime you like, share ownership of an object with another person, you don't really own 100% of that object, right? If you, if you go in on a snowmobile with your roommate and you each pay half, how much of a snowmobile do you own? half a snowmobile, right? But you can't actually have half a snowmobile. Really, it's one snowmobile and half the time your roommate uses it and half the time you use it, right? And so the formal charge is basically applying that same logic to electrons, right? And so when we look at something at a particular Lewis dot structure, we look at all the different atoms that are in it and we say, okay, how many electrons does it own, either outright or shared? And then we compare that to the periodic table. How many valence electrons does that element have when it's neutral on the periodic table? So for instance, if we look at carbon, carbon's got eight valence electrons around it right now, but it doesn't actually quote unquote, own any of them outright. It's sharing all eight of its electrons, right? So on average, how many, how many electrons does it own? Four. Four, right. So going back to the snowmobile analogy, carbon owns half of eight snowmobiles, which means it's got eight snowmobiles when it needs them, its valence is filled with eight snowmobiles, but it really only owns four if you sum it all up, right? So if carbon has four electrons, quote unquote, owned, how many electrons does carbon have in its valence when it's on the periodic table, when it's neutral on the periodic table? Four. Four. So that means that we would say that the formal charge for this carbon is zero. It has the same number of electrons owned as carbon would if it was neutral on the periodic table. What about up here? What's the formal charge? So formal charge equals zero. What about the carbon up here? How many does it own? Still four, right? So it's still got a formal charge of zero on that carbon. What about this oxygen? How many electrons does it own? 
it's got six that it owns outright plus a pair that are shared, right? Which gives it a total of what? To eight in its valence, but it owns seven of them, right? These ones are all owned outright. It owns all of those. It owns six snowmobiles by itself. And then it has a pair of snowmobiles that are, that are shared. And if you think this sounds, seems like a tortured analogy, you haven't met my father-in-law who both owns six snowmobiles and shares two more. That actually is, that's a thing in Minnesota. Um, because he doesn't need eight snowmobiles all the time, but when all of his kids and so their significant others are around, he does need eight snowmobiles. So he owns six outright and shares two of them, which means he actually owns seven snowmobiles. Six outright plus half of two more. So that's seven electrons owned. And how many electrons does oxygen have on the periodic table in, the, in its valence? Six. So it has one extra electron compared to the periodic table. So what's its formal charge? Positive one or negative one? Negative one, because it's got one extra electron, right? Normally, if we we're just counting protons versus electrons, we'd say it's got an extra electron, it's negative. This oxygen controls seven electrons, it owns seven electrons. And on the periodic table, it would have six. So it's got one extra electron. So the formal charge here for this oxygen is negative one. How many electrons does this oxygen own? Well, it's got two outright and then three pairs that are shared, right? So it's got total eight around it, but six of them are shared. So how many does it own? Five, two outright, and then half of these six. So that's five electrons owned. And on the periodic table, oxygen wants six electrons, right? Or it has six electrons when it's neutral. So what's the formal charge on this oxygen? Plus one, it's got one fewer electron. Despite having a full valence, it's got one fewer electron than it would if, it, if you just look at the periodic table. So it's got a formal charge of plus one. These two oxygens are identical on both sides, right? So we can do both of them at the same time. How many electrons does this oxygen own? Two pairs outright, so that's four. And then it's got four electrons that are fitted on top of. So that gives us another two electrons. That gives us six electrons owned. And what does that do for formal charge? It's even, which means charge is zero. So you don't always have to write your zeros like that, but when I'm drawing oxygens and writing zeros right now, Next to each other, I try to, to cross my zeros to make it clear that those are not that's not another oxygen over there. So, how does this help us? Well, the reason that formal charge was really even invented is it was because it's not a real thing. Formal charge is not, we're not actually saying this oxygen has a plus one charge because it's still got eight electrons around it. This is just a way of understanding how electrons get shared in the most stable way. It's gonna be what keeps all the formal charges closest to zero. A formal charge of zero is more stable than a formal charge of plus one or minus one. 
So in this top example, all three atoms have a formal charge of zero. That's more stable than this bottom case where you've got a plus one, a zero, and a minus one. So that's our third criteria for did we do our Lewis dot structures properly? Number one, most important is did I use the right number of electrons? That's non negotiable. Number two is did I fill all the valences? That's occasionally negotiable. Usually, that's a pretty hard rule, though, too. And the third criteria is do I keep my formal charges as close to zero as possible? Right. And if you do your formal charges properly, the formal charges will add up to the overall charge on the molecule. And CO2 is neutral, right? It's got an overall charge of zero, which means all of our formal charges need to add up to zero when we sum them, which they do up here, zero plus zero plus zero. And they do down here as well, because we had plus one, zero, and minus one. Still adds up to zero, but tells us we did our formal charges properly. But this is a better option for our Lewis dot structure. If you wrote this on the test, you still fulfill the first two of the three requirements. So that's like, a, you know, I guess a two thirds credit probably. Probably even a little more like three quarters credit because those first two requirements are the most important. Then we get into well, what do we do if there's more than one option that meets the criteria? This removes the ambiguity from it. It's not, well, because it looks symmetric and symmetric things are better. It's because the formal charges are closer to zero. And this also explains how we can violate the octet rule sometimes. Because let's look at, what's a good example? IF5. Yeah, let's do IF5s. How many valence electrons do we have to work with with this one? And iodine and chlorine are both in the same column, so we're getting the same number of electrons from each of them, right? So we have seven electrons from iodine, seven electrons from each fluorine, valence electrons. So that gives us 42 electrons to work with. They both have the same number of vacancies. So how do we decide what goes in the middle? Uh, Electronegativity. So fluorine is the most electronegative. You're never going to put fluorine in the middle of anything ever because it is so much more electronegative than anything else that it will never share more than it has to. So I goes in the middle, which means we've got to find room for five fluorines around it. How many electrons do we have left? Or how many, yeah, how many electrons did we use? We used 10 there. So how many electrons do we have left? 32 electrons left. How many does each fluorine still need? Each fluorine still needs an, an additional six. So six times five is gonna use up 30 of our 32 electrons when we do that, right? But we can go ahead and add those on there. I'm just using the other color just for the sake of not making it look too crowded up here. And since the most interesting things are happening in the middle and I don't wanna crowd the middle, I'm not gonna write my little loops like normal around those, those pairs of electrons for now. So now we're down to two electrons left. Where do they go? They can't go to the fluorines. One, because 
That's partly because we have two electrons and five fluorines. How would we decide how to divvy those up? But more importantly, fluorine is in the second row of the periodic table, which means it will never have more than eight electrons in its valence. Which means iodine is the only option. So we met criteria one. We use the right number of electrons. This looks a little bit weird, but at least everything doesn't have too few electrons. We have one iodine that looks like it has too many electrons, but we'll talk about that in a second. But at least everything has a full valence, right? What's the formal charge for each of the fluorines? How many fluorines or how many electrons does each fluorine have now? As eight around it, but two of them are shared. So for the purposes, so for the purposes of filling valences, each fluorine has eight. For the purposes of formal ch charge, that's when we say, well, but really it only has half of those. So each fluorine has seven electrons owned, which gives it a formal charge of what? Zero, because it started out with seven electrons on the periodic table, right? Okay, so fluorines are stable. You can't get closer to zero than a formal charge of zero, right? So fluorines are good. What's the formal charge on the iodine? Sorry, let me rephrase. How many electrons does the iodine have? Now say it. Seven. Seven. Iodine has five pairs of electrons in bonds that it owns half of, right? So it's got five electrons that it co-owns, and then it's got a pair that it owns outright. So iodine also has seven pairs of electrons or seven uh, electrons owned. And how many does it have on the periodic table? Which gives us a formal charge of also zero. So this is a stable compound, even though it looks like, even though it looks weird that we have 12 electrons around this iodine, it's stable because we still have everything with a formal charge of zero. We met all three of our requirements. Use the right number of electrons, all the valences are filled, and everything has a formal charge of zero, which means this is a fairly stable compound, despite the fact it looks weird compared to just thinking about octets. Right, so this is when the octet rule gets broken. When you have you have to have an atom that has a deep orbital, so something in the third row or below. And you've got to have something where you're going to have extra leftover electrons. And when they have, if you have extra electrons, they have to go somewhere. And sometimes you break the octet rule just because it makes all of your formal charges lower. Right. So going back to the question that Matt asked earlier when we had sulfur dichloride written up here and we had all these pairs of electrons and since sulfur is in the third row of the periodic table we're allowed to violate the octet rule if it's going to make our formal charges lower so if we wanted to see which of these is a better option That's using the same number of electrons stuff here, right? So this is also a valid Lewis dot structure. But what does that do to the formal charge? Well, sulfur has a, I believe it's like a four plus or four minus charge. So right now, sulfur's got two pairs of electrons that don't outright. So there's four, and then it has more electrons, right? 
So then it's got eight electrons that it owns half of those. So it's another four electrons, right? So the sulfur in this case has eight electrons owned. And it only has six electrons when it's neutral on the periodic table, right? So that gives this sulfur has a formal charge of minus two. And so to, to avoid confusing things, I'm going to, if I just draw an arrow with a number, that's your formal charge, just so it doesn't get too cluttered. What's the formal charge for each of the chlorines in this case? Yes. They own six electrons and they have seven on the periodic table. So it's not negative when they're missing an electron, which makes it a plus one charge. So that's okay, except what are our formal charges all up here? Zeros across the board. on the periodic that's stable you're not going to take lewis dot structure is make sure it's full screen sharing um, if your Lewis dot structure is the best possible Lewis dot structure. All right. And let's do this one because this is more practice with all of this. And then we'll take our break. Um, Actually, we'll do a couple of these. We're gonna do SO2. No. We're gonna do, as we'll start with SO, SO2. And um, we haven't learned how to name this properly yet. That's hydrocyanic acid. So SO2 and HCN. We're gonna do the Lewis stop structures to both of those and try and find the loose dot structure that has the best formal charges, formal charges closest to zero. So I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll start working on it.
So does that structure work for sulfur dioxide? It meets criteria one, right? We use the right number of electrons, but we don't have full valence for that sulfur, right? So if we've run out of electrons and we still need to fill valence, what do we do? Draw up double bond. And now that we've run the Again, the, the number one place that people uh, get messed up here is if you're going to draw a double bond and you've already used all of your electrons, you've got to start by erasing a, double, a lone pair. Right. So get rid of one of those and you're turning it into a double bond. So that satisfies the first two criteria. What does that do for our formal charges? What's the formal charge on the sulfur? Plus one. It owns two electrons outright, and then it has one, two, three bonds. They each count for one electron ohms. So that gives us a total of five electron zones and sulfur has six on the periodic table. So it's missing an electron compared to if it was neutral on the periodic table. How about this oxygen? Zero, right? It's got two electrons that it owns outright plus Sorry, two pairs of electrons it owns outright, two pairs in, in bonds that it owns half of. So that's a total of six electron zones, which is what it has on the periodic table. How many does it own here? Does the left hand oxygen own? Seven. So that gives it a what charge? A minus one charge. So this is a valid Lewis dot structure. Is there anything we could do to make it better though? Another double bond. Another double bond? Yeah, if you've got a negative charge right next to a positive charge, it makes sense that if, if you made this oxygen share one more pair of electrons, it would look just like this one that's neutral, right? And if you share one more pair of electrons with the sulfur, it gains an electron ohms. And so it'll be neutral too. So if we took this and erase a lone pair, and turn it into another double bond, well, one, for starters, that satisfies our human um, need for symmetry, right? We don't have one oxygen that looks different than the other oxygen, which is inherently something that raises red flags, whether we know why or not. And that takes it and makes each of those formal charges zero. So this is the best possible Lewis stock structure. The one we had first was a Lewis stock structure was valid. It met our first two criteria, but now we can check off the third one. All right, so if you have two possible options, see if there's a way that you can rearrange them to get those formal charges closer to zero. Occasionally, you're not, it's not going to be an option. You're going to have to leave it asymmetric for various reasons. If, for instance, if we had a nitrogen in the middle, nitrogen can't have more than two or more than eight electrons because it's on that second row of the periodic table. 
So we wouldn't be able to do this if it was nitrogen in the middle. We would just be stuck with an unstable compound. But this is exactly why if we, if we, let's see, the, the Lewis dot structure for NO2 for nitrogen dioxide, actually, sorry, for, well, we can actually have oxygen dioxide. If we put an oxygen there instead of the sulfur, we don't call it oxygen dioxide. But if we did this with, um, I'm just going to clear this one real quick. With an oxygen in the middle, oxygen should behave really similarly to uh, to sulfur, right? Same column and periodic table, but oxygen can't violate the octet rule. If we do this with oxygen, we do get this struck. No, not even can't even do that. No, that doesn't violate the octet rule. That's good. This molecule is called ozone. It's really nasty. It's really poisonous. Sulfur dioxide smells really, really bad. And in large enough amounts, it's toxic, but it's not like deadly toxic. It's unpleasant to be around. This is deadly toxic. Um, because it can't get a more stable Lewis dot structure. It's stuck like this because you can't make that oxygen have more than eight electrons because it only has a feed orbital to work with. Right, so this is one of the reasons why we have, despite the fact that they have the same, they're similar looking electron configurations, different rows of the periodic table behave a little bit differently even though they're broad similarities. So in this case, for ozone, that would be the best possible Lewis dot structure we could get, even though we're stuck with a formal charge of plus one and a formal charge of minus one. There's nothing we can do about it. All right, let's look at cyanic acid. I'm going to clear all this up and we'll do the same process. How many electrons do we have to work with? What's going to go in the middle? We'll show why that's the case with formal charge at the end. So I'm going to drop both options. How many electrons do we have left? Six electrons left. How many does the nitrogen need? So let's just put them there. So right off the bat, number of electrons, check. We don't have all full valences though. We don't have any more electrons to add. So our only option is to make a double bond. We'll start with the double and then we'll look at it. Are we good with that? Still doesn't fill all the valences, right? So was that Matt that said that or Anthony? So we do it again. We can't make hydrogen share again because it doesn't have a lone pair. But the nitrogen does have another lone pair that we can turn into a triple bond. If we went through all the exact same steps with this bottom structure, we would wind up that something looks pretty similar, just with the nitrogen in the middle instead of the carbon. Does this satisfy our second criteria? 
actually, I've been saying that wrong. Fun fact for everybody, does everybody know that criteria is inherently plural? Criteria by definition means more than one criterion is the singular of criteria. Just like data is inherently plural. If you have one piece of data, it's actually a datum. Fun facts about English you didn't know you were gonna learn in chemistry class. All right, so we satisfied our first two criteria. The third criteria, criterion, allows us to distinguish between which of these, which one's the better option. Our gut was to put carbon in the middle, it's less left or negative. And the reason that rule works is because of formal charge. Because what's the formal charge on everything on the top row? They're all zeros, right? Hydrogen only has one pair of electrons that it controls half of, so it's one electron owned. Carbon's got four bonds, no lone pairs, therefore four electron zones, which is the same as when it's neutral on the periodic table. Nitrogen has three bonds and one lone pair. So one, two, three, four, five. And it's got five when it's neutral on the periodic table. So that tells us right there that that's probably the best option. You can't get better than everything already having a formal charge of zero. At best, you might find something else that's equally as valid. Hydrogen looks the same here. Hydrogen's still zero. Nitrogen owns four electrons now, right? And it has five on the periodic table. So what's the charge on the nitrogen? Plus one. And what's the charge on the carbon? Minus one. Carbon controls five or owns five here. And on the periodic table, it has four. So despite both of these meeting the first two criteria, this is the better option. And the formal charge is how we can show that. Mm -hmm. Anything as a quadruple bond? Or do we not go there have there? been reports in primary literature of certain metals making a, a diatomic complex when they're also surrounded by organic material. Um, certain transition metals have been, I think molybdenum has been reported to have a quadruple bond, but in general, no. Um, basically, they, the way these bonds work, I'll answer this, or I'll, I'll talk about this real quick, uh, and then we'll take our break. And I've said that now for the last seven minutes, but um, this is a, actually a pretty relevant, but also easy to answer question. If we look at what these bonds look like, the bond in between the carbon and the nitrogen looks a little bit like you've got these two balloons sort of overlapping. And when you add those two together, you wind up with sort of a, a combined orbital, a hybridized orbital, like I mentioned in lab. Um, that is really a combination of the two separate orbitals. But when you, tr you can't do that twice, if you have a double bond, it can't be in the same spot because just physically, spatially, that area is already taken up by the first bond. And so what you get instead is you get another bond that basically looks like two normal P orbitals that are perpendicular to the other bond that basically sort of overlap. And you get sort of this canoe shape on top and bottom. All right, so this type of bond, when you have them directly overlapping like that, that's called a sigma bond. And this is called a pi bond. If we have a triple bond, where, where could we put the orbitals that are gonna do that? But well, this is already, it's remember a P orbital that has those two lobes to it is already up and down. It's all, both sides of this are one, one bond. The shaded part and the unshaded part are both the same bonds. Could you like that? Kind of, do a perpendicular. You make it so it's sticking straight out and going straight into the board. 
to make a triple bond. But now what do we do to make a quadruple bond? It has to get really weird. And that's why you only could possibly see a quadruple bond with something that has a D orbital, because the D orbitals are not going to overlap with these P orbitals that are also already taking up space. So it would be a third type of bond. It wouldn't be a sigma bond or a pi bond. When you get that fourth bond, it would be, I don't even know what they would call it. Um, probably not a delta bond because delta gets used too many places in the sciences already. Um, but they would probably come with some Greek, Greek letter for it. And it would basically like fill the gaps around these two. So more than what you asked for, um, hybridized orbitals and that kind of stuff will come back on the final, but we'll spend more time talking about it after the midterm. So relevant for now, but not entirely necessary. So let's take a break. Come back at 10 after and we'll just do a review.
First off, um, you will have have another chance to ask a review question if you if you need some time to process the the best version of the soft structures that we've been working on. Um, you do have time. You don't have a quiz this weekend, but on Monday and Tuesday mornings during the lap time slot, um, you can show up and and ask me questions. Basically, use that as extra office hours, extra time for for review. To get clarification. Uh, and also, like I said, I will also introduce next week's assignment. Next week's big assignment is the is the midterm, but then there's a sort of a writing assignment that we'll talk about. Actually, I'll, I'll hold off on that. I'll introduce it on Wednesday and Thursday morning in our last time slot there. Um, so that you don't you all you have to worry about on Monday and Tuesday is getting being ready for the test. And just because you're on the Tuesday lab section doesn't mean you can't come to Monday's um, lab time to to get help. If you need help on anything, are the I'm gonna write it so it shows up on the recording too. Um, 
on Monday and Wednesday, the or the Monday lab meets. Where am I? There it goes. Um, the Monday lab. Again. From 10.30 to 1.30. And actually my office hours are even before that. So I get here at nine on Mondays. So nine to 1.30 is sort of open. Anybody can come in any time in that time frame. And if I'm not in the in the lab, I'll be in my office just across the way in G2A. Um, and then Tuesday, lab is nine to noon. And then the test starts at one. So I wouldn't recommend planning on using Tuesday morning to cram because that's a little bit too late in the game for that. But if you have like a couple of last minute questions, like you know, after you were doing your you're finishing your studying on Monday, you realize you had one or two things you wanted to ask about, um, come Tuesday morning. And if that's your normal lab time slot, then you can use it to, to cram that whole time if you want. Um, hang out in the library, ask questions, whatever. All right, but that's all just more review time, all right? So with that in mind, what do you guys wanna review? Anything on the practice test that seems unreasonable, incomprehensible? Matt? The the, the mass of the isotopes? Yeah, the whole, the whole train. All right. So that is, so the basis for this question, it's gonna be something Something about atomic mass and weighted average and natural abundance, right? So it won't be neon. It'll be something like this, though, where I give you a bunch of percent abundances and a bunch of masses of isotopes, and I might ask you what the what the atomic mass is. If I give you all of these variables, I could ask you what the atomic mass is, and you just have to do the weighted average. If I ask you, if I give you the atomic mass, um, I could ask you to calculate one of the mass of a specific isotope if I do use an algebra, right? And the way that we would, would write this out um, is we have to remember that atomic mass in general, the, the compact but somewhat confusing to look at way of writing it is, Atomic mass is the sum of the, the mole fraction, which is percent abundance as a decimal of that isotope of an isotope times the mass of that isotope. And then you add up all the pieces for as many different isotopes as we have in the mixture. That's how many terms we're going to have here. Right? And we just add them all up. Right, so if we have this particular system, before, before I even plug in, start plugging in any numbers, I'm going to write it out showing all the variables and we can show how they all fit in there. So the atomic mass, if we have three different isotopes, we're going to have this three times with different I values. Right, so the mole fraction for neon 20, it's going to be the decimal equivalent of this percentage, so 0.9, and then the rest of the sig figs. Um, but again, sorry, I meant to. Is there a better? So the mole fraction of neon 20 times the mass of 20 plus the mole fraction of 21, plus the mass of 21, plus the mole fraction of 22, 
That was a mass of 22. So just writing it all out algebraically before we start subbing things in is going to allow us to see what the general steps are. These percent abundances as a decimal are what get plugged in for each of these small fraction terms. And the mass for each of these, for each specific isotope, is what gets plugged in next to that small fraction. And AM is atomic mass, either from the periodic table or if I give it to you up here. One tricky thing that I could do would be say would be to change the natural percent abundance. Say, okay, you have an enriched sample that has extra carbon 13 in it. What's the atomic mass for this sample? Would, but that'd be as simple as, I would still have to give you this whole table and then you'd be calculating atomic mass, right? So it's still the same process. It's just, I, and I have to give you all but one of these pieces. I could make it trickier by having four, isotopes instead of just three or having even two isotopes instead of three all that does is it means you're going to have one more or one fewer term mixed in here Great. so did you have anything specific about this one or you just didn't know where to start okay so from here would you know what to do now yeah we're missing this number we have everything else i'm not going to give you a system of equations on this one like we had in the ica remember the ica would say was these two isotopes occur at this ratio and then we had to, we had to write two different algebra equations and plug it in in order to get to this point i'm not going to do something like that on the test take home test you bet that's their game, and that's that's one of my favorites because it makes you come back and remember how to do this. Um, but on this midterm, I'm, you just have to be able to write this out, find what's missing, and substitute in the rest and solve. So it's, it's plug and shove once you get it set up like this. And so if I wanted to. Um, so I could do something like, okay, let's say we've got um, a sample of carbon that has carbon 13, carbon 14, and carbon 12, and carbon, and it's enriched so that your percent, the percent abundance of carbon 12 is 95.2%. Um, carbon 13 is uh, 0.010%. And carbon 14 makes up the difference. So I didn't exactly leave myself eat nice, easy numbers to fill in there. Um, the 4.79%. I think that adds up to 100. If it doesn't, it doesn't really matter for the sake of showing this example. And then I would, if I gave you the mass of each of those, I said, okay, what is the atomic mass of this particular sample? And it's not going to match the atomic mass on the periodic table. That's what makes this tricky. You can't just check your answer by comparing it to the atomic mass in the periodic table. If it's an enriched sample, that means that I changed the ratio of the isotopes compared to what they're normally found in the nature. If we wanted to do this, though, it still is the same process atomic mass equals mole fraction of 12 times mass of 12 plus mole fraction of 13 plus mass of 13 plus mole fraction of 14 times mass of 14. Now you have everything on the right hand side and you're just solving for the atomic mass. Not even solving, you're just doing arithmetic. All right, so there's there's only so many ways that I'm going to tweak this problem on the test. It's going to be something very similar to this. Maybe two terms, maybe four terms, maybe three terms. 
maybe I have you solve for a mass instead of solving for a percent of abundance. But it's going to be something that looks really similar to this. Questions on this problem? Also, if you didn't see it, I did upload the key for the practice test so you can check your answers. Um, go to the week six tab on, uh, on our Canvas shell. And you can find it there. So go to week six, post the key here. It's in my chicken scratch, but you should be able to read it all. Oh, all part two, okay. Part two A. Oh, I just plugged into the calculator wrong then. I probably hit plus. Um, the main thing that I'm looking for here is do you know what to do with the units and do you know what to do with the sig figs? And that doesn't change the sig figs. Your sig figs should still go to the tenths place because this number has our greatest uncertainty and it's plus or minus one in the tenths place. So, good catch. I was going too fast and trying to answer questions while I was writing the key at the same time. Sometimes that leads to arithmetic mistakes on my part. Can you go? Could you go over like the question page part of our age, just like ranking things with it and points? Yes, I did not put in a ton of explanation in the reasoning on those ones because I figured people were going to ask. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, so I also just say a note about how I write tests. Um, when I wrote this problem, I made it ambiguous a little bit on accident because you have two variables that kind of act in opposition to each other. Um, so if we look at beryllium, magnesium, and sulfur, so I'm going to pull up the periodic table so we're all looking at the same thing. All right, so is it beryllium, magnesium, and sulfur? Is that what I said? So when it comes to atomic radius, there are two variables that we're looking at, right? How many energy levels does it have? And how many electrons does it have? In, or how many protons does it have when we go left to right? In general, the variable that we're going to consider most significant is how many energy levels does it have? In terms of general trends, that's, that's a good assumption. And this case in particular, I should have asked about aluminum rather than sulfur, um, then it would actually behave that way. But because sulfur is so far over here on its own, it gets into a read because when you go left to right, you get smaller, right? Because you're adding protons. So we know that sulfur should be smaller than magnesium. We also know that beryllium should be smaller than magnesium. So when we're doing these ranking problems, if you're not sure where to start, start by making them pairs instead of thinking about it as a group of three. Think about it as pairs because we don't know how to compare beryllium to sulfur because we have two variables changing, but we know we can compare beryllium to magnesium and we can compare magnesium to sulfur. And when we look at that, we can say, okay, well, beryllium and magnesium are in the same column in the periodic table, but magnesium is a row lower which means it has an extra energy level, right? So we know that magnesium is bigger than beryllium. And then we also know that sulfur is in the same row as magnesium, but further to the right. So same energy level, but more protons, which means we expect sulfur to be smaller than magnesium as well. So we know magnesium is bigger than beryllium and magnesium is bigger than sulfur. Which answers one, we know what the biggest element is, right? We know magnesium has to be the biggest. Where I messed up is that I 
should have made it so that it made it clear that which one was in the middle because beryllium versus sulfur it's hard to tell which of them is going to be bigger because we know that beryllium is missing an energy level but we also know sulfur is way over there to the right which also makes it smaller so in this case if you have to decide the general rule is more energy levels is more significant so that would make beryllium smaller than sulfur because beryllium it has its valence in n equals two and sulfur is valence is n equals three so when in doubt but again i'm going to try to write the question so that it, it's more obvious um because i think that's following our our rules that we're talking through and that we've been using but i think if you actually look up the numbers you find that they're either really really close or sulfur might actually be slightly smaller than beryllium um, and that was not, not intentional. The rule that we're supposed to follow is the biggest deal is most energy levels. And then within each energy level, you look left to right, get smaller. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And then the other thing I will say about that page is um, make sure you're reading it carefully because they're not all going to be atomic radius. The first two are going to be atomic radius or ionic radius, but then C and D are either going to be ionization energy or electronegativity or electron affinity. Also periodic trends, but I think some people ran into issues on the quiz last week. Um, because they didn't see that it said ionization energy. They looked at it and they ranked them according to atomic radius instead. Um, so just be careful you don't get too much in, a, in the zone in a group and um, forget to read that, that uh, instruction part. Uh, any other, where else did you go? Sure. So if we look at um, ions versus atoms, again, it's the same logic for these, but ions means we can't just look at where it is on the periodic table. We have to look at what happens to its electrons, right? Because potassium plus one lost an electron, which means its valence is not four anymore. Its valence is n equals three when potassium it loses an electron, right? So that gives us n equals three is the valence and um, 18 electrons, right? And sulfide is the exact same thing. n equals three is the valence and 18 electrons. Versus sodium, which lost an electron and now has N equals two as its valence and only 10 electrons. So if we're going from largest to smallest, it makes the most sense to compare the one, the pair that are in the same column or the same row at the same time, right? So potassium is in the same column as sodium. So comparing these two to each other, which one is, is uh, largest between sodium ion or potassium ion? Potassium is larger, sodium is smaller because N equals two is our valence versus N equals three is our valence. And they're in the same column in the periodic table. So that means that, so we can write, Potassium ion is greater than or bigger than sodium ion, just so we can keep track of this. It's really easy when you have to do multiple steps with logic to lose, lose your train of thought for the first one once you start thinking about the second one, right? So it can be helpful to write them down like this. And then potassium and sulfur are not in the same row of the periodic table, but they have the same number of electrons and the same valence level now that they're both ions. So between these two, the only thing that's different is what? Number of protons. And 
More protons means bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller. So which has more protons out of these two? Potassium has more protons, which means potassium is smaller. So we can say that the sulfide is bigger than potassium ion. So this is the way that I try to write problems. What I was aiming for on part A, where it got into that gray area. If you look at it like this, it should line itself up nicely and neatly into one, two, three. You shouldn't have a case where you have to guess um, about, you know, I don't know about these. If you can set it up like this, it should give it to you nice and cleanly. If it doesn't, explain your reasoning. Take your best guess, explain your reasoning. You'll probably still get full credit. Well, I mean, if it's like the NA wasn't, didn't have a plus one, then. If NA didn't have a plus one, we wouldn't have a very good way to judge that necessarily. Probably the sodium atom, it would be N equals three and it would have by far the fewest protons. So sodium, if it was neutral, would probably be the biggest, but that's getting into that hazy. It's hard to say exactly without looking at the numbers. We have more than one thing happening at a time. All right, so our final answer then would be, and you can rank these, just write one, two, three. You can do it as, as greater than, less than signs. You can write smallest, medium, largest, however you want to describe it. Um, I would recommend against writing one, two, three, because then it gets really tricky with plus one the smallest or is one the biggest. Um, just try to be clear with that so that you don't wind up confusing yourself and me with your, with your logic on that. Questions on this one? All right, so final answer. The potassium is bigger than sodium, but potassium is smaller than sulfide. So sulfide is bigger than potassium, is bigger than sodium. Or you could write big, mid, small. If we switch to ionization energy, remember it's always gonna be the same logic with ionization energy. Number of protons, and what's the electron configuration look like before and after. Boron versus aluminum versus potassium. Boron and aluminum are in the same column on the periodic table, right? So the only difference in terms of their electron configuration is what's their highest occupied energy level, right? What's their valence? Aluminum has a, is the valence of N equals three, right? So it's going to be those valence electrons are going to be physically further from the nucleus than for boron. So aluminum's electrons should be easier to peel off than boron because boron's valence is N equals two. So that means boron has a higher ionization energy than aluminum. So we can say boron, greater than aluminum. And then potassium and aluminum are not in the same in the same row. Um, so we can actually just use the same logic. We don't even have to change our logic really, right? Potassium's got one electron it can lose really easily in N equals four. So it should be even easier to take an electron away from potassium than from aluminum. Sorry, it's even easier and shoot, I don't have a way to erase that. Um, aluminum has a higher ionization energy than potassium. Boron has a higher ionization energy than aluminum. It's easy with ionization energy to do what I just did and mix up 
highest versus lowest of those greater than less than, it's easier to take an electron away from potassium, which means its ionization energy is lower. It takes less energy to peel that electron away. So the smallest, the lowest ionization energy would be potassium, then aluminum, then boron. Questions about ionization energy for the general trends there? All right, so I will, this is another thing that I will just tell you I'm going to do. The reason that I ask them in this order is the first one was general trends. Nothing tricky about it in terms of ions or anything like that. And then I made it a little tricky by asking about ions. Then asked general trends for ionization energy, which means the last one is going to be a little bit trickier. And so in this case, looking at carbon versus nitrogen versus oxygen, they're all right next to each other on the periodic table, right? And when they're all that close to each other on the periodic table, in the same row, the way we decide is by looking at what's their electron configuration before and after. Right, so for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, carbon, they all have their, their um, highest occupied orbital is the 2p for each of them. Carbon's 2p looks like this. Nitrogen looks like this. Oxygen looks like that. So in general, things that are further to the right, things that have more protons are gonna be harder to take electrons away from because they have more protons. Which means we can look at carbon and say carbon is probably the easiest to take an electron away from. But out of these two, we have to consider the exactly halfway filled issue. Or if we had a case where, where one of them had an exactly uh, a completely filled S orbital versus a P orbital with one electron. It's easier to take an electron away from oxygen because then you get to exactly halfway filled. And exactly halfway filled gave us that stability bonus. And so the nitrogen already has that. So it's harder to take an electron away from nitrogen than it is from oxygen. Because if we take an electron away from oxygen, we get to something that's more stable. But if we take an, elect an electron away from nitrogen, we're breaking up something that's extra stable. So carbon should be the easiest. Carbon's going to have the lowest ionization energy. And then out of these two, oxygen is easier to take an electron from than nitrogen. So nitrogen will have the highest ionization energy, then oxygen, then carbon. Right, so it goes because of the exactly halfway filled nature of this one. And means we actually have to look at the individual electrons rather than just looking at further to the right means higher ionization. If you answered it that way, if you answered it just, I'm just going to go straight in order, they go left to right, carbon's got to be the easiest, oxygen's got to be the hardest. That's the wrong answer, but if you explain your logic like that, I can still give you most of the credit, right? Because you just missed the, the tricky part, the splitting hairs part. Which really is all that separates chemistry from physics. Is in chemistry, we know how to split hairs. And in physics, they just make assumptions. Assume zero air resistance. All right, any other questions on number eight or just in general? Um, so, for like the electron jump and molecular geometry, or you have to be memorizing all the different uh, types of. 
No, good question. Thanks for reminding me. Um, I would recommend memorizing the names for the electron geometries because there's only five of them. And you've got to know them backwards and forwards. Everything is one of those five electron geometries. So that makes your life easier if you just have those down. But then there's all those different molecular geometries within each type of, um, of uh, electron geometry. Right, so the electron geometries are always going to be one of these. Linear, trigonal, planar, tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal, or octahedral. The molecular geometries, if you have lone pairs involved, so basically you find your electron geometry and then you move over based on how many lone pairs you have. I don't, for this, for this test, I don't care if you have these names memorized. If you don't have them memorized though, you've got to be able to draw them accurately and using those wedges and dashes properly. And that actually can act be harder sometimes um, because if you draw your tetrahedral structure incorrectly, by drawing, say this, if you draw this wedge line over there in between the two flat bonds, that's actually wrong. It actually will give you the wrong structure if you do that. So you have to be careful about how you draw them if you take that route. So it's not, it's easier to, not, to just draw them versus harder to memorize them. They're both hard differently. Right, and so I would still at least draw them to get an idea of what it is um just what it looks like because i find that easier rather than having to just randomly memorize five electron domains for two lone pairs is blah blah, blah. i would start by drawing that and then like okay and the name of that was whatever t-shaped all right so but either approach is valid for this test i would mark you down if you just draw them um you just have to be careful and then you if for the molecular geometry you shouldn't it'll be the same as the electronic geometry except without the lone pair shown so if i was answering this question i could say okay ammonia There's my Lewis dot structure, four electron domains. Therefore, it's a tetrahedral electron geometry. I'm gonna draw it. I'm gonna draw my lone pair as being one of the bonds that's up in the, that's in the plane of the board. And then I'm gonna draw a hydrogen and a hydrogen into the board and a hydrogen out of the board. Drawing the molecular geometry would just look like that. You still need to show enough of that same structure. And remember that just because we erase the lone pair doesn't mean it's not there still taking up space. Um, I mentioned this yesterday, lab, but I forgot to say today. People have a tendency to when they get rid of the lone pair to show the molecular geometry, to treat it like it's going to flatten out, like the electron pair is gone, just because we can't see it. We can't see it, but we see the effects of it. It's still pushing these other three things around, right? So all you're gonna do is, if you drew your electron geometry properly, your molecular geometry is draw it the exact same way without any lone pairs. Everything else in the same position. David? Is there more than one way to correctly draw the electron geometry? Yeah, so I'm going to use, put it in this box, but it's the same. I'm going to use the same molecule. Um, with tetrahedral shapes, the, by convention, you kind of draw it like it's trigonal planar, where you have them sort of equally spaced around the circle, except one of them has two things attached there, one that goes into the board and one that comes out of the board. Um, but which one you pick to put where, where doesn't really matter. You could say, you know, put the lone pair back into the board and the hydrogen out and a hydrogen over here and a hydrogen up here, or you could draw it as um, like that. 
that still a tetrahedral shape. The key thing with, with, the, with the tetrahedral shape is that two of the bonds are flat, and then the other two bonds are pointed vaguely in the same direction, one out and one in. If you do it that way, then you'll, you'll always get a valid tetrahedral structure. What you don't want to do is draw it like that instead of this one. Because when you get to OCAM, that will actually give you wrong answers. Even though it looks like you still have all the same bonds, it doesn't look all that different on paper, it will be an issue in, in OCAM if you start doing that. So, and since I'm an organic chemist by training, um, I'm going to be picky about that. So if you're going to do it the drawing way, just make sure you draw it correctly. Yeah. All right, what if we draw it and write the name for one of them? It depends on how wrong, but usually I'll take the one that's right. So if you do your best for both of them, if you do, if you, if you try to use that approach because you're not sure it's, you know, it's one of two options. So you guess geometry for one and then you draw the other one. I can usually tell when that's happening and, and I don't give the same amount of credit, credit that way. But if you're, you know, you just misspell tetrahedral or something or along those lines, then, but you drew it correctly, that's full credit. Okay. That's probably your safest bet. Um, as long as you don't mix up, you know, mix up your names too much, do your do your best. Basically, if, when they wildly don't match each other, is when that starts looking suspect. Yeah. You know. All right. Any other questions for right now? I do have office hours for another hour, and I'm, I'm fine staying here, just keeping you know doing this for for another hour, um, or going down to my office and working with with uh, any of you who want to go work on paper down there. I got it one more. Okay. Yeah, so let me let me actually go back to a clean cage. So there's a couple ways you can approach this. Uh, M squared a big centimeter. Pounds per gallon. So when you have these combined units like this, yeah, you can the the simplest way conceptually do it. That takes more writing sometimes. Um, would be to split it up and say, okay, let's say I've got 19 grams and I'm going to convert that to pounds. And then I've got to go with that 19.3 grams. I've also got one cubic centimeter that I can put in gallons. And then you'll get a really small number for each of those. And then you can do, do the division, which is the way I showed it with E. Um, so, you know, then you, you would just 19.3 grams, convert that to pounds. And then take uh, one cubic centimeter because anytime we've got this per term, that means that that's one on the bottom, right? And then whatever we get in pounds, which I think it winds up with was zero point two something or something like that. I got five, oh, three, six. Oh, three, six. Okay. And then divided by whatever we get in gallons, which is something times 10 to the minus four, right? That's the two, yeah. maybe. Okay. What's the other way to do it? I think I did it both ways when I got the transition. Okay. So then the other way to do it would be to leave it all as one combined conversion. Nineteen point three grams over one cubic centimeter, and you can convert this unit that's on the bottom by canceling out on the top, just like you normally would cancel it out. So you can say one centimeter is two, or sorry, two point four five four centimeters is one inch.
and we have to do that three times. And then we could do a convert. Now we'd be in inches cubed on bottom. So that would give us grams per cubic inch. And then we can say, well, 231 cubic inches is one gallon. And that's from our conversion sheet. That's how I knew to go to inches was because I know that my definition of a gallon was 231 cubic inches. So I would start, if I need to get to gallons, I've got to get to cubic inches first. And then that gives my units on the bottom where I want them right now. That's now I'm in grams on top and gallons on bottom. So if I just stop there, I'd be grams per gallon. We just need to take that one step further. And now we're going to cancel out the unit that's on top by putting 453.59 grams on bottom and one pound on top. All right, so this is just it's less writing, it's more compact to do it all in one step, um, but it's really going to be the same exact math that you were doing the other way. Right, but this in this approach works any for any combined. If you had miles per hour and you wanted to get to meters per second, you set it up like this and you convert your seconds to hours, then you convert your meters to miles. You don't have to cube the conversion to one. You do not because this so because this conversion factor has cubed in that's part of the definition of it if you cubed this conversion you get gallons cubed and gallons cubed doesn't make any sense right and so if you do it this way if you if you wrote it this way you didn't get the same answer within sig figs it should be about 100 115 something like that if i'm remembering properly um grams or pounds per gallon 161. Um, I'm just kind of curious. Um, so that could be that could be the same within six cakes, but you because you only have two six cakes there. Okay. So when you do it the way where you break it up into separate steps, make sure you get your six cakes right and you don't over round because then that could cause when you then do the division at the end. You get the wrong answer. Um, so just be careful. And actually, that's one case where it's okay not to do your rounding since everything is multiplication or division. In this, we're not doing any addition or subtraction. You can keep all of your decimal places when you do it as separate, or you know, keep one extra decimal place at least before you, and then we'll do your final rounding when you do the division at the end. Um, and that would, if you do that, that will probably give you 161. You're just not quite close enough to call it sig figs. Yeah. Probably because of that. Yeah, I think I because I got, I think I got 161 doing it this way. Yeah. Which I just plug it all into, you know, I just did it all in fact whatever. So, and reminder, just a PSA. That's only two sig figs. We get to keep three sig figs. Remember that one doesn't count. As a sig fig, so you would want to keep one digit past that. Okay. Um, and that even just doing that would probably be enough to get you a lot closer to 161 on there. All It is the charge of the overall molecule. Um, so this is one of the things that I meant to mention and forgot. Um, it's not that tricky if you if you go with what we've been doing, everything still works. Um, it just means that we're gonna wind up with so we get three oxygens that each bring six electrons plus one carbon that brings four electrons, plus the charge, which is an extra two electrons. So that gives us a total of 24 electrons, not the 22 that we would get if it was just CO3. All right, so then our Lewis dot structure winds up being carbon in the middle, oxygen, 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 so that used up six of our 24. And I'm going to switch over. I really don't like this program. So I'm going to switch back to Excel.
So I can erase as we're going. Spoiler alert. So we had 24 electrons. Now we're down to 18 electrons left. Each oxygen still needs six, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. That used all 18. So now we're out of electrons. Oxygens are all satisfied, but carbon needs one additional pair. So what do we do when we run out of electrons? Make a double bond. So we take, pick any of the oxygens, it doesn't matter which one. You raise a pair of electrons and turn it into a double bond. So now we use the right number of electrons. Criterion one is good. Everything's got double valence. Criterion two is good. Could we do anything to fix the formal charge? What has the formal charge here? Well, carbon's got control of four electrons and it's got four when it's neutral. So carbon's good. Formal charge is zero. Oxygen here has control of six electrons and it's got six on the periodic table. So that oxygen also has a formal charge of zero. These two each have control of seven electrons and it would be six on the periodic table, right? So they each have a negative one charge. We can't really get any of them any closer to a formal charge of zero. Because remember that the formal charges have to add up to the overall charge of the molecule. The overall charge of the molecule is minus two, right? So we still want to keep them all as close to zero as possible, but we have we know we're gonna to have to have a minus one or a minus two in there, either two minus ones or a minus two in there. And there's really no other way that we can arrange these that's not going to, to give it something too many electrons or to break up a full valence. So even though we have a negative one charge on both of those, that's still good. That's the best we can do for the formal charge. So that's our best Lewis stop structure for this compound or for this ion. And then if we want to turn around and look at the geometry of it, now we're not concerned about about the um, formal charge and all. So I'm gonna erase those. How many electron domains do we have? Three. Three around the carbon, I mean. So yeah, which is still three, you're right. It still counts as one electron domain. It's still stuck between that carbon and the oxygen, right? If it's still stuck between those two atoms, it's still in the same spatial area as, um, as the single bond would be, right? So three electron domains, which means our electron geometry is what? Trig trigonal planar, yep. And are any of them lone pairs? Any of our electron domains lone, lone pairs? Which means our molecular geometry is the same as our electron geometry. Anytime you have no lone pairs around that metal atom, electron geometry and molecular geometry are going to be the same. Right? Because there's three things taking up space around the carbon and we can see all three of them. So nothing changes. That get match up with what you were thinking? Answer your question? Yeah, it's just, it took me a long time to get there, but I wanted to see. Yeah, it's that the only difference with 
ions still follow all of our same rules. The ion um, number just kind of it adjusts our number of valence electrons, either by having a few too many or having one, yeah, having too few. However, it, um, whatever the charge is, it's going to just tweak that number of electrons. So, uh, a lot of times, um, in this case, and when we when we come back. Um, we'll, want, we'll see that because I picked an, an oxygen at random, um, it actually could just as easily have been any of the other oxygens, which means instead of having a double bond here and a single and a single, really it behaves more like you've got one and a third in, to each of the oxygens. Because remember, these electrons are probabilities, right? They're not actually locked into being in just one spot. And so you actually get something that looks like it's kind of really, really rapidly cycling between a double bond to all of the oxygens. Think about how a airplane propeller has might have three pieces to it, but once it starts spinning fast enough, it just kind of looks like a disc, right? The electrons do the same thing um, when you have more than one option for how you can put that, that double bond. But for now, for this, yeah, they're going to look a little like asymmetric because we're not going to do this yet. Okay. Chase, do you have any questions? I was curious what was going on with the second one on the same page for the dot structure. That one's BRF5. Yeah. Just because it looks like the in the electron geometry structure. So BRF5, we wind up with the electron dot structure. Five fluorines. Each fluorine has six electrons. And I'm just doing this from memory. Normally, we'd go through the process of counting the electrons and figuring everything out. But since you've already worked through all that, I assume that, that you got here, right? And then we have an extra pair of electrons stuck on that bromine, right? So that used the right number of electrons. Everything has a full valence. Um, and we can look at it at the formal charge to see if, if this is a stable compound or not. There's not really any alternate way we could arrange it though. So we don't really even need to do that in this case. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the geometry goes, we've got six things taking up space around the bromine, right? So our electron geometry is going to be um, is going to be octahedral. Um, and I'm just going to draw it out as well so we can see what's happening. So And so then what does that do for the um, molecular geometry? That just, I like the um, molecular geometry just means we can't see the lone pair, right? Square parameter. I, I kind of I drew it a little bit backwards. We usually think of pyramids as having their flat side on the bottom and with the point up towards the top, but that's what the shape is going to be, right? It's like an octahedral shape, like that that eight sided guy or that that sort of diamond looking shape, um, with one of the points missing. And it really doesn't matter which point. We think of the ones on up and down as looking different than this, but in theory. We could have, you know, put the lone pair over here and left this as a fluorine there. And it's harder to visualize it, but that's also a square pyramidal. Um, if we look at it in terms of. 
if we define these four as being, or all of that as being flat, and then the fluorine sticking into the back is the, um, would be the point of that one. Sorry, what were you saying, Brenner? So that's that's just as valid to, to put the lone pair over here, right? Because they're all um, they're all equally close. They're all ninety degrees from everything else. So unless you have two lone pairs. All we really need to worry about is, you know, just pick one of them and replace it with a long pair. No, no, it's it would look funny, but remember these are three dimensional objects, right? That, that yeah, we were drawing them flat on a piece of paper, but that's the reason why I had to use that that app on the website is so that you can click and drag it around however you want to orient it. Um, and that, that would apply. We could put that lone pair oriented whatever way we want. Jasper, do you have a question? Mine's an Excel question, so I wouldn't mind. It's not nearly as pressing with theirs. Do you have anything in the chamber? I'm ready. You good? Thank you. Okay. Chase, I see you're fat enough, so I assume you're good to go too. I think so. Okay. So you know where to find me on my here if you need it. So that save as button right there. Yeah. So you see where it says save as type. Save it as a regular Excel workbook. Yeah. We don't want to Excel out of the book. So that's a lot of applications. There are school machines out there running really old for John Spell. So, but for the most part. Okay, the default works. And especially, so, uh, and I guess, you know, think about it. how do you know how many of the back and forward ones we're supposed to draw the shapes? There's a convenient way to draw it off the shapes. There's an infinite way to draw yeah, another way to do it. Arrange them all. Like, 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 you can arrange it however you want. And other than that, every one of these electron geometries has like a conventional way to draw it. It's kind of the, the standard. You can just memorize that, and get used to doing it that way. You don't have to memorize it. It just winds up being easier sometimes. Yeah, I can see it being easier. Although, you know, I guess looking at the little model thing you gave us might help. Yeah, that, that helps for sure.